All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining this talk. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm a, a data, science, uh, data, science, data scientist at uh, Big Data Republic. I'm giving this talk together with Dan Davy. Dan Davy is a director of engineering and architecture at KLM. And uh, we'll be talking about a full cycle data science project where we designed, developed, and industrialized a machine learning application uh, to forecast the number of passengers that will board an airline flight, so for KLM. Um, yeah, so what was this about? Let's get started. So KLM tries to, has tried to consistently deliver the customer promise uh, to get the right amount of meals uh, on board an aircraft. Um, so we have 360 flights per day at KLM and about uh, 34 million passengers uh, and um, they all need meals, snacks, drinks, etc. So this is a complicated supply chain process and um, uh, let's have a look at that. So we have a flight that departs at the far right and before that, 70 to 7 days before departure, we need to basically source our raw materials for our meals and drinks and snacks, etc. Then two or three days before departure, we need to uh, produce the meals. So there's still some production going on. And uh, six to four hours before departure, we have a final adjustment. So then all the loadings are adjusted. So we have just the right amount of meals on board. Because you can imagine if you have too many meals, you have a lot of waste. And if you have too little, that's not, a, that's not an option. And then you cannot deliver the customer promise. So then you need to have a last minute adjustment. And that's also very costly. So um, what is important for all these three uh, uh, moments is that we have a correct passenger forecast, that we know how many people will actually board this flight. And um, uh, yeah, that is, that's actually what this whole project is about. So previously, this was done by an external supplier, an external system. And um, uh, yeah, that is what we wanted to replace. Why did we want to do that? For several reasons. First, we wanted to save license costs of the external supplier. Okay, but also we want to be able to uh, adapt more quickly, more uh, 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 yeah, more quickly to changes in the system. It, maybe you want to forecast specific types of meals. Maybe you want to have a little more cost for oversupply than for undersupply, or vice versa. All these changes, we want to have quick control over it. Also, we want to use state-of-the-art big data technology, machine learning technologies, to improve the accuracy of this model. And we have at KLM a lot of data, more data than the, than the old system uses. Yeah? So we want to use, leverage all this data to make the best possible predictions. And also we want to keep everything in-house to guarantee the security, get, keep the data at KLM. So that's why we built MOBS, it's called. It stands for Meals On Board System. Uh, and it's a fully functional in-house forecasting system. By the way, this name was designed together with the end users, with the catering department, and they, they came up with it. So that's also uh, a way to, uh, yeah, to, to keep close to your end user with such system. And this enabling the business to deliver uh, just the around am a right amount of meals to the aircraft. So in really simple terms, it looks like this. It's a system that takes a lot of flight data, uh, throws it into an algorithm, and then comes out a passenger forecast, and we'll go into details a bit more later or how that works. So the approach for this, and that's also what I want to emphasize, is a, this talk will also a bit about the whole journey, not just the technology. As you start with this, this data science or machine learning project, you usually have three distinct phases. You have an idea phase, an experimentation phase, and a phase where you industrialize or productionize your uh, solution to become really a data product. Yeah, and there were several steps, so you usually have a proof of concept phase, uh, then you can build your business case, you, can, you know whether it's actually feasible to make these predictions. And all there's these fixed decision moments, you want to uh, go live or not, etc. Uh, uh, productionize, and then there's the moment where you put the new solution live and start using it in the operation. And, and after that follows a phase of continuous improvement. And We'll be talking about all these three phases. To manage that, you basically need a multidisciplinary team of, uh, of course, your end users, uh, product owners, the data scientists, uh, the data engineers, and solution architects. So it's really a, a big team effort, different specialists. And talk a bit about uh, a brief overview of the architectural solution before we go into the details. 
Uh, you have your data sources. They'll go into a database that contains data about all the flights. Then there's the algorithm, uh, predict, making predictions for each of the flights. Uh, those events are sent to this uh, Mules on Board application. That's an application in the middle that applies business logic, forwards the events, etc. But also exposes a web interface for the end user. And also forwards the forecast to the catering system. So basically that, 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 that does the ordering uh, and these kind of things. So this is how the uh, final uh, product looks. You have a, 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 yeah, a portal and a web interface for the user where you have uh, can see for each specific flight, when does it depart, what's the forecast for which moment, etc. So, and uh, with this system, uh, uh, we have uh, several improvements. So first, one to note is that we have full control about the reliability. If if we we can uh, make sure that all the flights have a usable forecast. That was previously not the case. And now we have 100% for each flight, we have the correct forecast. And previously we ha didn't have that. And this, that saves about 80 of these manual adjustments per day. So that's, uh, that's quite significant. But also, very important, we improve the accuracy as predicted. So we reduce the error by 17%. These are relative. Uh, uh, compared to the previous system, and also we made it more stable, so the spread is, is, is lower. And in terms of cost saved, uh, um, yeah, I, I can tell that this, this literally goes beyond peanuts. So uh, you, have <laughs> you have a lot of uh, uh, savings. Yeah. Um, so going back to the cycle, we're now going to zoom in a bit on this experiment phase. What does it take to move beyond that? Uh, how do you take this proof of concept to a shadow deployment, which I'll talk about, and the algorithms and the methods we used? So to do that as a data scientist, the first thing you do with this kind of assignment, so we now introduce the use case, is that you want to understand the data value chain. And that's what you do. You start with the value. What kind of value are you going to deliver? Well, actually, we talked about that just a second ago. Uh, it's uh, it's to deliver the optimal catering. How are you going to do that? By which action? Uh, and this is made by the catering department, so they basically supply the amount of meals. But to do that, they need an insight. And this insight, that's basically our value proposition. That's the passenger forecast. That's what we're going to deliver. And how are we going to get that insight? You guessed it, we get it from the data. So this is the value chain, it's really important to map it, to understand it, uh, to, to solve the right problem, basically, uh, for your end user. And I will zoom in about this part, and that's where the, the modeling takes place. So then we go back again to what, what kind of insight do we need to deliver. We, need, uh, uh, we have this moment of departure, we have these planning moments, uh, we need the passenger forecast. These planning moments can be in different uh, times before departure, so we call them horizons. That's what we need to do. But that brings us to the following requirements for our system. Uh, we need for all the upcoming flights at any moment, so basically these specific moments are most important, but we want to be very flexible in each moment for departure, uh, predict uh, uh, the, the, the number of passengers. We want to do that as accurate as possible. And what is accurate, I'll revis revisit that uh, uh, in a moment. So the system. Uh, looks like this, I already talked about that, so it takes in flight and booking data, machine learning algorithm, forecasted passengers. And then we're going to add to that, so here I mapped it on the data value chain, eh? data, insight. But also we have, after the flight leaves, we know actually in our data how many people board it. So that's our, our ground truth, our actual boarded passengers. And we fed that back to the data. That's our feedback loop. That's also very important because that makes sure that the algorithm can learn, can learn, can learn, gets better over time. And to express it a bit, uh, this is the only formula. <laughs> no, it's not the only formula actually, but the most important, most important one. Uh, we want to predict this orange thing, the boarded passengers. Why? Using X. And X is everything we have on this side, our data. Um, and exactly what, what is why exactly? You want to basically uh, minimize the amount of change that, uh, uh, that the business, the end user needs to take. So if we go back to this value chain, we have our supply chain process, and we have our insight here again. 
Well, actually, we know that the current process is based on the, just the number of expected passengers. So there's not really a range, or it's, it's basically the number of expected passengers. So one single number, and that drives the entire process. So that, so that number determines how many snacks, how many Coca-Cola, how many uh, uh, salmon meals, etc. So there's a whole process behind it. Of course, we can also predict the amount of uh, uh, chicken or salmon pastas that they need to take on board. But then you have a lot of change management in your process. So we go for this just this expected number of passengers. And if you then look at the problem, this is basically textbook regression for, uh, in data science terms. And then the, the thing that you're going to do is say, OK, what kind of input data do we take? So um, what is basically the first thing that comes to mind when you're going to predict the number of passengers that will board a flight? Any ideas? Number of seats? Uh, what would you say? The upgrades of, uh, of passengers? The show up rate, the no-show rate. That's also a good one, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the what? The online check-in, yeah, but you only have that online check-in uh, uh, a very uh, short amount for departure. But that's a good one, let's keep it in mind. The tickets sold, yes, the booking number. So just the book passengers, and it's okay, let's, why, why don't we take that? Uh, isn't this the same as the ones that, uh, that will actually uh, 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 board the, the flight? No, that's because you have last minute bookings, uh, people booking in the time between you have made this uh, uh, production uh, uh, plan and, uh, and the actual departure. But also uh, the, the no-show rate, yeah, there it is. So that's, there's uh, people that cannot make their flight for various reasons. Aircraft changes, so aircraft types, yeah, so maybe we swap the aircraft, have a bigger aircraft, change the seats, seatings, etc. Uh, those all contribute to that, uh, that makes it a com more complex problem. So we have varied data sources. Basically, we need to take the bookings, we take aircraft uh, data, the location, so where does it go, and that's basically uh, something that tells us a bit about the no-show rate per destination, for instance. And also the time it leaves, uh, is it a very busy moment, is there a lot of traffic, these kind of things are hidden in, in the, the, the time of departure. And we want to look for interactions, so if the location is, uh, is, 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 is New York and the aircraft size is big, what then happens? So that's what we need an algorithm that can get this, those patterns out of the data. Um, and another important input, and that has to do with the requirements, is that we uh, 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 want to give the model uh, basically an indicator of how far before departure are we. And that allows us to make one model that can, for each point in, the, in departure, give a forecast. So traditionally what you would do is make many uh, uh, models uh, that, can, that are each suited to predict at a certain moment for departure. But we make one model and basically tell the model how far it is before departure. And so the hours to departure, also known as the query moment, is something we give to the model. And then it can learn that the closer you are to departure, the higher the, the booking number and the lower the adjustment, etc. These kind of tar uh, these kind of patterns. If we look a bit more about the, the thing that we want to predict, so the number of the expected number of passengers, um, what we do here is a trick. We don't predict this number. Uh, in itself, we predict the offset with the current booking number. So if you look at this, here we say, okay, here's the number of passengers, 100, 200, 300. Uh, the number of boarded passengers is uh, 225. And the number of booked passengers uh, at a certain moment before departure is something like that. Then we look at the difference, and that's what we try to predict. So if the, uh, uh, basically you can see that the model basically makes a correction on the, uh, the current booking counter. And that makes it a lot easier for the model to learn other stuff than just learn this offset. And so we focus on learning all these interactions with the booking number. If you are close to departure, maybe the booking number should be adjusted down yeah, because you have the no-shows. If you're far away from departure, then you need to adjust the booking number up because you have a lot of extra bookings coming in. These kind of interactions. <coughs> And then, of course, you need to look at metrics. What are you trying to optimize? Where are you going to look at? And you can look at metrics from multiple um, uh, levels. 
And you're looking from a business uh, perspective, so that's the highest level in, the, in this pyramid I'm going to sketch here, where you can look at customer satisfaction, so do, do we do deliver this customer promise, or the, co or the cost reduction uh, in terms of waste or uh, other uh, inefficiencies in the process. You can look at the user, so catering is really looking at undersupply, oversupply, and of course it translates into these metrics. And you can look at model metrics, and that's something you can also compute offline, basically, so in simulations. That's uh, something like the mean absolute error. And um, we basically go into this one now because it's very close to the other ones and, uh, and it, it gives a good, a good metric to, uh, to optimize. It's closely related to the business calls because if you have one person too many, then you also have one meal too many. Um, so what is it? Really simple, simple actually. So we have a number of boarded passengers. That's what we actually want to do. We forecast it a little bit below. Then we take basically the absolute difference. And that's our mean absolute error. So we average that for all the predictions that we make. Uh, we do that for different, uh, uh, different slices of the data. And that's very important because they have a different impact on the business process. So we drill a bit down, so we, we have, of course, cabin class, we have economy and business class, and business class meal is a lot more expensive than an economy class meal. Um, we also have different flight groups, so we can have flights within Europe, but also longer flights, intercontinental flights. They have a different, uh, different impact on the business process. So we use these icons for, and also we have different, a third dimension, which are the uh, 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 hours before departure. If you're very for, uh, far before, uh, we, we're very far away from departure, then it's easier to make adjustments in the process. If you're just about to uh, depart, lift off, then it's very tricky to make, uh, costly to make adjustments. All right, so how does the, uh, uh, we visualize this performance of the model, so this mean absolute error in the following way. We can, for each hour before departure, so in the short term, the day before departure, or the longer term, and this is a different, different x-axis, days before departure. We can make the error, and of course you see that the error goes down the closer you come to departure. It's more easy to predict how many people will board if you are close to departure. So this is the main graph that we show, and then we do that for each of the slices that I just uh, outlined. We also look at each point here, a crucial point in the graph, these are uh, these, these production moments. What is the spread? And that's what we call the residual, so basically uh, uh, what your model predicted minus uh, uh, what was actually the, the actual boarded passengers, and then you look at, uh, okay, if it's, if it's on this side, it means it's undersupply, and this side means oversupply. You want to keep it as narrow as possible, centered around zero. Yeah, you want to make sure that the spread is not too high because the, the, these large out, uh, if you have a large oversupply, it has a large impact on the business process. So we do this for each of those slices. How do we validate if a model is correct or is good? Uh, we take all the data that we have, so several years of uh, data, historical data, then we split that, basically. We split the last part. It's called a temporal split. We split the last part. We keep it for, to validate our model. So we're trying to make a model on this data and then test it, validate it here. That's called cross-validation, holdout data set. And we also make a third sort of uh, independent data set. Uh, and that's what we use to uh, iterate our model. So to develop our model, we, we also want to have a bit of an independent data set. And we use this one to do the final test that we report to our stakeholders. So this data set, how does it look? Uh, this, uh, I, uh, all the code, I have two slides with code, uh, are Python. So this is a classic uh, uh, it's a library called Pandas that we use. It's uh, to, to represent data frames. So it's really easy. You have uh, yeah, like an Excel on steroids. So you have a, a data frame. And this is how it looks. So we have IDs for the, each row is a flight. We have in each row all these features from the aircraft, from the bookings, but also we know how many people board it. That's our target. So this is the data that we have. And now we need something to learn these patterns. Okay, now we get into the algorithm. Now we'll talk about uh, decision trees, gradient boosting decision trees. And this is an algorithm which is, is very good at detecting these interactions and has uh, very little assumptions. Uh, and uh, it's very widely used in, uh, in the data science uh, uh, world. Um, so what we uh, to outline how the algorithm works, we wanted to minimize 
the, uh, the mean absolute error, yeah, so to predict most accurately the, the number of boarded passengers. And so say we have some training data, some example flights here, four example flights. We can make a decision tree. So the decision tree basically looks at the data and, and says, okay, if the booking number is higher than 120, then go to that side, other go to that side. So that's called a split. So then some flights from the training data might up end up here. That's, that's called a leaf. And then the average of all the, uh, 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 yeah, the number of boarded passengers in here is called the prediction. That's what we're going to predict then. And that tree can learn all kinds of split. And it does it in a way, so all these splits are learned, does it in a way to minimize this mean absolute error loss. And when you have that tree, you can then use it to put new data in to make predictions. That's basically the logic of decision tree. So I, would, I, talk, not, I talk about decision trees. So, so we do, we're going to make multiple of these trees. And then we're going to average the outcome. So here we have the same tree that we just had. We're going to add a second one. The second one is trained on a different subset of the data. So it might ma make different, it will make different splits than the other one. So you get all kinds of slightly different decision trees and you're going to combine them and average them out. That works really well um, uh, to, to get more stable predictions. And so here uh, for the light blue, we just sum this prediction and that prediction and then you get to five. Uh, and then we have one final ingredient, which is the boosting part. And boosting can be thought of as homing in on mistakes that the model makes. So uh, here we have uh, the first tree, and it might make some mistakes. Here, these guys here, uh, there was an error because the dark blue was, uh, uh, or this one here, I don't know, yeah, I, maybe I mislabeled them, but uh, there's a mistake in here. And then the next time you do it, basically the next tree that you train, is going to get zoomed in on those errors that the previous one made. That's basically the logic. You can uh, see that this is a sequential process, so each subsequent tree will correct the errors of the, the next or the, of the previous one. And that's called boosting, and that also works really well. Um, so how do you train this kind of model? So what, luckily what we can do is we can use a very popular package called LightGBM, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can use that to train such a gradient boosting decision tree model. And what we then do is we define this pipeline. Yeah? So it's, it contains of several steps. First, some pre-processing steps. So you need to extract all this data to get the data frame that I just showed you. And then you apply this uh, uh, light GBM gradient boosting uh, machine regressor on it. Yeah, it has some parameters. You can uh, sh sh uh, tell it what kind of features are there in. Are there some categorical features? Are there missing values? And this one, what is the thing that we want to minimize? That's the mean absolute error loss. And you make thousand trees, for instance. And then you can just say, okay, I fit this object with my training data, my features, and my Y, my boarded passengers, and some parameters. And uh, of course, there are also other parameters of such a model, but how to optimize this beyond the scope of this talk. But that's also something you need to take care of when you do this. Okay, that worked out uh, in uh, simulations. Yeah, so what we call a backtest, when we do this on historical data, it all worked out. Uh, but then it's time to hook up the real data. So time for a real test. Yeah, but before you can do that, you have to do the following. You basically have to look at which features that you used are ac actually uh, available in production, and if not, are they so important that you want to get them in your production system? Uh, and that's for, for that you can use the uh, concept of gain, and gain is something that tells you in the decision trees how important is this variable. So if you then see that some variable is really not contributing much, you can basically drop it, and then also you save engineering efforts. You don't have to then do engineering on it and basically get it into your system. And another thing is that we usually work in notebooks, so basically interactive code uh, uh, in, in, and text, uh, basically an analysis notebook. I don't know if you're familiar with the software, which is called Jupyter. And we, we want to make a proper software package of it. So we basically make unit tests, uh, 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 setup.py, requirements, dependencies, etc. So that's all something to do. And then you can deploy it in uh, shadow mode. So then you can basically predict for 
uh, in, in, on production data for each flight, what is the uh, passenger forecast, but you do it in such a way that leaves the current business project un unaffected. So here we have the current system produces a forecast, producing an action that influences the supply chain process. And now we have our new system, MOPS, that gets the real-time data, where Dan, Dan talk about in a moment, uh, uh, feeds it into MOPS, gives this uh, forecast, but then nothing happens with the forecast. So then the end user and the data scientist and everybody can scrutinize whether this is actually meets the requirements of the system. One of the challenges we encountered is so-called training serving skew, which basically says that uh, something that is in your historical data, so variable x1 in our hysterical, historical data, is actually not the same as what we have in our production environment. And this is, sounds really stupid, but it uh, occurs a lot in the, in, in when you try to bring uh, data science solutions to production. And of course you can solve it by figuring out uh, why are, are these variables not the same, what's going on, uh, with, and then try to engineer your way out of it, or you can have another model, which we also did, that tries to correct for these discrepancies. Okay, so the shadow deployment was also successful. We scored significantly better than the old solution. So that meant we were ready to proceed with the next step. So for interim takeaways of my part of the talk, is that this understanding of the data value chain is, is key to define this machine learning problem, basically build your solution around it. Also, it's very important to get your stakeholders uh, in the, uh, committed in this process by doing such thing as this shadow mode, where they can really get involved in the whole uh, uh, solution that you made and basically scrutinize it and approve it, see its value, and then also always think simplicity over complexity to get a really minimal viable, so you don't make a fancy neural network or whatever that predicts uh, densities uh, over uh, passengers, but basically you do with that, that which is minimal viable, that minimizes the need for change management. So now I give the word to Dan, uh, and we'll talk about the industrialization phase. So we're gonna do a quick, uh, super Sounds quick swap. Sure. So it? Yes. Yes, that Very works, good. right? Let's put it in my pocket. Excellent, guys. So we uh, had a, have a super nice model right now, which Alex and his team of intrepid data scientists built for us, and it performs far better than the old model, than the old system. But we also want to run it in a in an production environment, and we want it to be s as reliable as possible, right? So why do we want to industrialize? So what do our users expect of us, of this model? Not only do they expect these great predictions that we make, but they also expect 100% uh, expect uptime, on-time predictions, and no missing predictions. Uh, Alex men mentioned a bit the time horizons that we work on, the, 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 the query moment, so to say. We do not only want to slightly be on that time we want to make a prediction, we want to make a prediction exactly at the time. For example, let's say 17 days before departure, the catering department makes an order, they do that at nine o'clock in the morning, they don't want it to be one second later. So we want to make sure that the predictions are in when the business needs them. And we also want to make sure that we have no missing predictions. And as Alex already spoiled for, uh, spoiled for us, we had 100% uh, coverage. So. But we as developers of this model also have some expectations, right? We want it to be easy to update and maintain because once we've built this model, we want to at some point move on to a next business problem and build a new model for something else. And we don't want to have a full-time job maintaining this old model. We want it to be bug-free and we want, to, we want it to be easy to monitor and alert upon. So how do we do that? Uh, first, I will t t tell you a bit how we used to do it. So. The, uh, this is what I would like to call the predictions in the Wild West. So this is basically what uh, data science at KLM looked like before we did MOPS. I'm exaggerating a bit, but still the point is clear. So we built, every, every data scientist built their own custom API on top of their model with their own custom GUI. They used outdated data from an unsupported MongoDB instance that was running somewhere in their office. It was not up, up the, the data was not up to date, and the MongoDB instance was not supported by anyone. 
and the, they ran the model on an unsupported server that was running under someone's desk. This is literally the case, by the way. So, as you can probably already guess, this will mean that we have no monitoring and alerting in place. If the model stops working at some point, we don't know about it until, until the business calls us and says, hey, I'm not receiving any predictions any, anymore. What the hell is wrong? We have no real-time input data. Uh, for example, we often had in this MongoDB instance data that was refresh, refreshed once a day. And this is, might not make a lot of difference when you're talking about 17 days before departure, but when you want to know exactly how many meals you need to bring on board two hours before departure, you want to make sure that you have the most up-to-date booking numbers to make the prediction, for example, and not rely on something that was refreshed only, uh, let's say, 12 hours ago this morning. And we had no support at all. We, I mean, there was no phone number that the business could call when the predictions would not roll, not roll in. But the good thing is, we still were delivering business value. I mean, the models were being deployed at KLM and being used. So we decided to work on a slightly better way to do it. We had this super nice system in which we uh, collected all the data of uh, the KLM operation. It's called Flight 720. I will talk about it a bit later. And what did we do? We just uh, we uh, used all that data, which was real time, to make predictions. So instead of having to use data that was only refreshed this morning, we have the data was that was collected on the last second before we made the prediction. So we stored these predictions in the Flight 720 database. I will talk about that a little bit later. And they were served through the Flight 720 API. Um, there were still some problematic points, though, because we had no idea how to, where to actually run this uh, prediction model, like physically. And the only thing we had was Flight 720, which, as you will see later on, is a big Hadoop cluster. So well, we have a Hadoop cluster, can we run some Python code on it? Yeah, apparently we can. Should we? Maybe not, but we still did. So we had some custom Python script running on a Hadoop cluster node. This Python script was kicked off peri periodically on these query moments, this, this time horizons, by some old-fashioned enterprise scheduling system that KLM was using, and it was very hard to use. In fact, Fun fact, I, uh, I'm using a Mac, and this scheduling system, you could only configure it using a Windows client, so I had to use boot up a VM to do this. And sometimes prediction would, predictions would like randomly fail, and we would not get any feedback. There was still no monitoring in place, and there was no standard deployment method. We just did this for this particular, uh, for this particular use case. So we had some wins. We have real-time data, and we have some place to store the predictions and to serve them, but we don't have a reliable infrastructure yet. So we thought, how can we do this better? And how can we make it more reliant, reliable? So what do we really want? We want to have real-time data as input for our predictions, because more recent data makes for better predictions. We want to have on-time predictions, so predictions are at the, made at the right moment with little delay. We want to have 100% coverage, no missing predictions. And maybe most importantly, we want to have monitoring alerting. When, when either of these things uh, fail, we don't have on-time predictions, we don't have 100% coverage, we want to know before, we need to know, want to know about it before the business tells us. So, uh, and we want to have automatic retraining. So, well, instead of somebody from Alex's team running the training session again on, this, on their own laptop, we want to have, uh, whenever there's new data available, like, uh, uh, or a new version of the model, we want to retrain it. So, go a bit into detail about how we did this. Uh, first, I need to talk a bit about the Flight 720, which I already mentioned. So Flight 720 is uh, the real-time data collection and processing system from uh, KLM operations, which is used for all the super nice machine learning models that the data scientists built and all the optimization tools that our operation research people built. It is basically built around Spark streaming, and that's what you see here in the middle. KLM backend systems produce a lot of events. Every time a change happens on the passenger, we get an update of this. Every time a flight gets rescheduled or the capacity changes, we get an update. Every time baggage changes, well, you get the idea, right? All these events are published to an enterprise event broker. KLM is an enterprise, we, so we do have an enterprise event broker, of course. Uh, we don't want to work with old XML, so the enterprise event broker translates all of this into nice JSON events. We receive it on a Kafka bus. 
we have a bunch of Spark streaming jobs interpreting and combining this data and storing the results into HBase from which they are uh, served by an API. We call that the Turnaround Intelligence API. What we also do is anytime we see changes in this data, for example, the, uh, the booking number changes, and we make a new prediction based on that, we publish an event of ourselves. So we say, hey, the prediction was updated. This is basically Flight 720, and it's the source of all the data for the prediction model. So we wanted to move away from this model running on as a custom Python script on the Hadoop cluster. Um, Pandas like to live free, but they'll mess up your Hadoop cluster because we had a lot of, uh, we wanted to introduce many more different models and they all had different package requirements, for example. And we were struggling to have different kind of Anaconda virtual and Python virtual environments on our Hadoop cluster. So what is the solution? We'll ship them in a container. So we use Docker for this. So how do we schedule in a robust way then? Because, okay, it's super nice that we can now run our model in Docker, but what about this uh, having 100% coverage? How do we prevent any of these pieces of Flight 720 or the model going down from not having a forecast at all? So what do we do? We generate timestamps for, for the right time windows. We publish those timestamps to Kafka. And now we have decoupled scheduling from predicting and from the database and from the input and output. Now we can also predict in a robust way because now we can listen to these timestamps from Kafka. We can read features from HBase. We can make predictions and we can write those predictions to HBase again. If the database is down, HBase for example, which might occasionally happen, then the timestamps to trigger these predictions, they are still in the Kafka queue. We can pick them up later. That means that we will at least have 100% coverage then. So how do we tackle the monitoring alert and alerting? Because I mentioned that as well. We push metrics to Prometheus to, for uh, using alerting. Metrics like, um, hey, we made a prediction for this time window for this flight. Metrics like, um, one of the Kafka, one of the Sparks uh, streaming workers is down or up. Um, metrics like we have made, now we can see we have made so many predictions in so many minutes. So we can be alerted by, by this by making custom alert rules and we feed them to, for example, email or Slack. So one of the engineers gets woken up when, for example, the number of predictions dips below what we expect. Um, what we also do is we, uh, we do not only want to have alerting on the sort of infrastructure metrics, uh, but we also want to have some uh, alerting on the performance of the, of the model and the coverage. How do we do that? We, have, uh, we use Spotfire, which is a visualization tool, and in Spotfire we build a dashboard on top of HBase and Hive, which is a SQL and Hadoop technology, to monitor two things, the coverage and the model performance. Both are very easy to do, right? You just look into your database and you look which are the rows which are historical and don't have a prediction. Well, then we have less than 100% coverage. You can also easily uh, monitor the model performance by using this mean absolute error. You just look at, uh, we now know for all the historical flights, we know the prediction, we know the actual people on board, so we can compare the to those two to each other. If we see a, s a sharp decline in the performance, then we will notify the data science team and they will look at the model and we will look at their data. So what does this in total all look like? We have the scheduler thing. It's, it's a actually a very dumb component. It will just look at what historical, uh, sorry, what time horizons do you have? For example, 70 days before departure, six days before departure, two hours before departure. It will generate timestamps for those for each flight. Then we have an executor. The scheduler will publish these timestamps to Kafka as events. The executor will pick them up, will read some data from the database, will make a prediction, and will get the, uh, write the prediction back to HBase, and then we will uh, expose these predictions through the API, which mobs can then use. So that we have some wins now, right? We have the real-time data as input for predictions, we use Flight 720 for that. The on-time predictions, we use the dedicated scheduler for that. And the 100% coverage is done by decoupling the scheduling, the predicting, and the monitoring and alerting. Uh, we have that in place as well with Prometheus and the Spotfire dashboard. Uh, we don't have automatic retraining yet, though. 
And there's another interesting pattern emerging here because if we do this for every new model that we build, we build all these custom schedulers and, 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 and executors, and this is pretty com complicated machinery that we don't want to be rebuilding every time again and again. Another problem is that for this executor thing, the, w the thing that picks up timestamps, makes predictions based on that, we have a problem, the problem that the model is very tightly coupled to this executor. So it's very hard for data scientists to improve upon the model without also touching the executor code, which is more of an engineering piece of machinery. So we wanted to see, okay, can we implement the, implement the good things that we just built, generalize them and take away the bad things so we can do more uh, real-time monitoring on the, metro on the evaluation, for example. Um, we can do, uh, look at the feature quality in real-time, and we can do automatic retraining. This is what we call FORGE, and FORGE is a project that, that facilitates the following things. We have a way to generate data sets to train models on, regardless of what model we want, Basically, Flight 720 is a treasure trove of operational data. We want the data scientists to be able to look at it as a candy store and say, we want this feature, this feature, this feature, and this feature, and we want to uh, feed that to our model and make a prediction based on it, on these time horizons. Um, we also want to take care of automatically training the model whenever the model changes or the data changes significantly. Uh, we want to expose the model through an API, and we don't want to recreate the same API over and over again. This should be automated. We want to have an automated way of deploying the model. We want to generate predictions at the right moment, a scheduling problem. We see that occur with every new business problem that we tackle. You, especially at an airline, you always want, almost always want to predict, uh, make predictions relative to some timestamp in your operational processes. The departure of an airplane, the check-in of a passenger, you get the gist. We want to have a general, uh, general system in place for monitoring, evaluating, and alerting. Um, and we want to reiterate on everything that you see here whenever the data and the model changes. This is in a nutshell what Forge looks like. I will try to give a short uh, introduction to it, but you can ask me questions later. So what we did is we basically took the ideas of the executor and schedule that we had and we generalized over them. We, had a, we have a, 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 a short configuration file that each uh, data scientist writes for the model. They, they only write their model, super simple, in one class with a predict function, an evaluate function, and a train fun function, I guess. Um, uh, we built around that a whole lot of machinery in which will automatically deploy this. We, uh, so every time uh, Alexander pushes a new version of his model uh, through Git, the, we will look at the configuration file that says, what features do you want from Flight 720? It will automatically generate a training set for him. It will automatically train the model through Docker. And will deploy the trained model uh, with an automatically wrapped API on Kubernetes. Then, the model, when it's deployed, you can see that here, it will actually notify as a, a generic scheduler component, and it will tell the scheduler component, hey, I'm a new model, I've just been deployed, and I want you to uh, kick my butt whenever this, these particular query moments happen. So the scheduler will just generate these timestamps again, but will not do it for one model, it will do it for all these models. And it will, tell, it will just put messages on the Kafka bus saying, for this model, just this particular timestamp just occurred. Then we have a separate uh, microservice that's called the feature fetcher. It will look at what, uh, what features, according to the configuration file, does this particular model want. Uh, it will fetch the features from Flight 720, and it will send an yet another message. This will then, then arrive at the deployed model. That will just feed these features into the uh, predict function, and it will send yet again a message to the persister, which will take care of storing these predictions, in this case, in HBase. And then we have an evaluator, which will, uh, at the same time when a prediction is made, check what is the mean absolute error and notify Prometheus of this. The super nice thing is this, th about this is that each of these components exists autonomously from the rest. One of them can go down. All the data will still be stored in Kafka. There will be no downtime uh, uh, 
like no, of no, no data loss at all. And um, we can easily replace parts of this machinery for other things. For example, if we decide, well, HBase is not the right place to store our predictions anymore, we can store our predictions in Postgres. And this basically is the overview of Forge. So now we have strong decoupling of uh, components, robust type safe code in Scala, because instead of writing all these components in Python, we did it in Scala. We are robust in the phase, uh, phase of failures. It's scalable, because we can actually add more predictor, uh, uh, more persistors, more schedules if we want to. Um, it's, it's completely decoupled model, so the data scientists only have to care about the model. It's performant and easy to monitor, and easy to get started with new models. This is basically our talk. Thank you. Thank you.